Yeah, yeah, when I was young, when I was a boy, when I was like uh, four, five, six, you know, I remember playing with the neighborhood kids, right? Uh, and I had a wonderful time. I was living in Los Angeles, and I remember those times, I had this big wheel, right? Uh, this this r red and yellow plastic tricycle, right? And I, I'd race around in it, you know, and I'd, and I'd like race really fast, you know, and I was like four years old and I'd drift with it, you know? I was really good at drifting it on the, on the sidewalk and on the street. And this was a, a suburban street in the San Fernando Valley. And, uh, you know, there was very little traffic and the traffic was slow going. And of course, there are a boatload of kids all over the place. And so, it, there was no real concern about, you know, a car running over me or anything like that. Or at least I didn't have any concern. I just enjoyed myself. And not just on the big wheel, of course, but playing with my friends. Some were older and a couple were younger. And we'd, we'd go around like this little pack, you know, this, this little pack of wild kids. And I remember retrospectively a sense of belonging, you know, that sense of, of belonging, of, of, uh, of having a place where I fit in, where everyone was happy to see me. Mm -hmm. And there was no tension, there was no undercurrent of anything. They were just happy to see me. And I experienced that uh, occasionally over the years after that. I remember when I was like, uh, I don't know, like eight years old, we were living in Chile at the time. And I, I remember going at, to this great aunt's house over in a neighborhood called La Reina. Now, back in the day, she had this huge, huge uh, house on this enormous plot of land. It was really like a mansion, really. And uh, it, it, it was just, a, I don't know how big it was, but it was huge. It, it felt like the country, right? Even though it was in the middle of the city. And with my cousins, we'd run around and have a great time, right? I remember that very clearly. We just like, just all running around and having barbecue and just having a wonderful time. And, um, and a few times after that, I had that sense of just belonging. You know, unselfconscious, just natural, just feeling wonderful, feeling as if I was in the place where I belonged, where I was in, in, in the slot that was mine. Of all the universe of slots in the world, I was in the one that fit me. And I felt wonderful those times, yeah? I'm not going to deny it. It was, it was just a wonderful feeling. Oh yeah. And I have to say, in all the years since those times, I always try to recapture that feeling. You know, I, I always yearn for that feeling. Yearn for that feeling, and I suspect that, you know, most guys do too. Yearn for that feeling of just naturally belonging. Uh, uh, without any kind of thought or effort. You just fit in, yeah? And everybody fits in with you and you just feel all together and everybody laughs at the same jokes and everybody is taking care of each other and just, you know, that, that natural sense of just belonging, yeah? I'm 51 and I yearn for that feeling, still. You know, I yearn for it. I, it's, it's almost like a need. Mm. Uh, yeah, it's a need. Yeah, but the problem with that need is that it can never be satiated, you know? It can never be fulfilled. Mm -hmm. I mean, and this has been my experience, is that over time, as you grow older, you find it impossible to really belong. Mm -hmm. You can partially belong, you know, like, like, a, like, a, like a Lego piece that's sort of misshapen and like part of it fits together with the other pieces, but another big part of it doesn't, you know. And you can never really belong. Mm -hmm. I used to think that, you know, when I was a teenager and I really felt on the outs with the people around me, I, I thought sometimes that it was my fault and sometimes I thought it was their fault. But the conclusion I've come to over the years is that the, the society that we live in has organized itself in a way that we're all independent contractors. <laughs> yeah, we're all like floating atoms. Mm -hmm. we, we float away from one another and there's really no place where we fit, okay? Uh, we, we float away and, and the society wants us to fit into different places for the sake of work, for the sake of being productive members of this society. 
productive members being productive in the money-making sense, okay? I mean, our society loves it when we make money. When we, we find a place for ourselves where we make shit tons of money, and just by repeating the same activity over and over and over again, you know, the, the society gives us money as the prize for our repetitive activity. It gives us a prize in so far as money is concerned for fitting in. Yeah? I remember when I was a, a, a writer, a novelist, writing thrillers, and I, I sensed that what everybody wanted was for me to just write the same thriller over and over and over again so that the publishers could make money, so that the agents could make money, so that the, um, the press people at the publishing house would have a job to do, i.e. push my book, so that the editor would have a job to do, i.e. edit my book, so, so that everybody, so that the machine would keep on grinding along. And everybody wanted to, me to be this cog, this cog that would fit in, that would fit in and, and just connect with the other gears around it, and the whole machine would turn repetitively but predictably. Repetitively and predictably and productively, so that everybody would get some money. Everybody would get some, you know, some benefits, you know. Some money, some, some prize, you know, just for doing the same thing over and over again. That's what everybody wanted me to do. And, and the thing is, see, it wasn't that I would belong, or let me rephrase it, I would belong if I did this. If I worked the same job and did exactly the same thing over and over and over again, I would be rewarded. I would be rewarded with money, but also I would be rewarded with esteem. Esteem and a sense of belonging. And I remember, you know, going to a, a few luncheons, a, a few little parties or whatever. I remember very clearly I went to see um, not the premiere of Jerry Maguire, you know, the Cameron Crowe movie, but rather it was a it was a industry preview of Jerry Maguire. It, I saw this this preview like maybe two months before the movie came out, right? And we were all publishing people. I was visiting New York because at the time I was living in LA, but I visited in New York and my agent and my editor took me to this industry premiere. And all the people who watched the movie in, in this theater, they were all part of New York publishing. And they were all established, they were all at big houses, they all had names within the industry. And there was this tacit sense that I could be a member there, I could belong there. And all I had to do was just repeat myself over and over and over again. Be a good cog, just turning around and around in the machine, doing the same thing over and over again. And I remember very clearly feeling at once welcomed and yet rejecting it. Hmm? And yeah, I, I just I just couldn't I couldn't fathom myself living that life. But the thing is, see, at the time, I couldn't articulate it, okay? I mean, instinctively, I felt that I didn't want to be that repetitive cog in the machine. But I didn't know how to articulate it. I, I couldn't explain my dissatisfaction. By all rights, I should have been incredibly happy because I was getting money, a lot of money, and I was being offered a slot where I could belong. And yet, there was that sense that I don't want to belong in this slot there was a dissatisfaction with the slot that was all set up for me. And going to this, this uh, industry premiere of Jerry Maguire, you know, and watching this movie with these other people around me who were all part of this machine, and I was, you know, silently, tacitly being promised that I would be, I would belong if I only repeated myself and limited myself. Mm -hmm. And see, that's ultimately the conundrum. See, because you can belong. You can belong to some milieu, some work milieu especially. You can belong to some work milieu, some, some work environment, some, some industry or what have you, but all you have to do is limit yourself. See, because the, the trade-off of belonging and, and being free, well, that's, that's a trade-off that I've seen all of my life. That the only way to belong is to limit yourself. And if you want to be free to explore who you are and, and do what you want to do on your terms, then you have to sacrifice that sense of belonging. 
you cannot have both. You cannot have freedom and belonging at the same time. Because the, 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 the price to achieve one is the other. You see? And it's only when you're a child, as, as I was, you know, that's the only time when you can belong and be free. Mm? That's the only time. Because you're a child, you're an infant, yeah? I mean, I'm telling you those times that I, was, I felt so happy and so fulfilled. That's the thing. I felt so fulfilled. And yet, at the same time, I felt with such belonging because I was an infant, right? But that sense of fulfillment that you get from true freedom, mm, that sense of fulfillment and satisfaction of doing things on your terms as you want them to be and not on somebody else's terms, that satisfaction, sweet it is, as it is, comes at the very bitter price of never belonging. Mm. You will never belong. If that's what, what gets you high, that sense of satisfaction, of doing things on your terms, you will never belong. And by the flip side, of course, if belonging, that sense of coziness, that sense of like everybody knows your name and everybody's happy to see you, and even your enemies and your adversaries and competitors are happy to see you because you're, you're, you're one of them, you're, you fit in, right? Well, that, that sense of belonging, see, if you want that, then you can never be free. You, you forever have to be the cog in the machine. You have to be this very predictable cog that fits in very squarely with the other cogs. And if you don't fit in, if you, you try to express yourself more, then no, you'll be rejected. You'll be just cast out. Uh, the, the whole point is to limit yourself so that you fit in. And if you refuse to limit yourself in order to fit in, then you're going to be tossed out and replaced by somebody else who does want to fit in, who does want to fulfill their expectations, who will be predictable and do what everybody around them expects them to do. Hmm? Now, here's a key issue. It's not necessarily bad. You see, there's this uh, romantic notion that comes from the 19th century romantics and Nietzsche and what have you, that it's better to be, uh, you know, free, totally free to do whatever you want than to uh, limit yourself in order to belong. But this is naive and stupid, okay? It, it really is. Because there's nothing wrong with prioritizing belonging, just as there's nothing wrong with prioritizing freedom. Uh, if you understand that there is a, 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 a trade-off, it can be one or the other, but not both. Well, either one is perfectly fine and perfectly legitimate, all right? I think that there are a lot of people, especially guys who are on the outside, if you will, who, who traded in belonging for freedom and perhaps did not achieve the heights that they wanted to and it did not become as free as they hoped they would be. They're the ones who tend to shit all over the people who traded in their freedom for the sense of belonging. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at Nietzsche himself, right? Nietzsche himself originally started as an academic. He was an academic and he was very successful, but then he started to rebel about, uh, against these strictures that, uh, that, that, that kept him in line, that kept him as a member of the machine, as a cog in the machine, right? He started to rebel about, against those limitations and eventually found himself being expunged from the machine, from the academic machine in, in Germany at the time. Mm -hmm. And he went off and he wrote his books and they were unsuccessful. Okay, of course, now we know who Nietzsche is. And he's a big name and all the rest of it. But at the time, he was just considered a failed academic and his ideas were considered crazy. Mm -hmm. He himself was labeled a crazy man. Well, point of fact, he wound up being go going crazy with syphilis and what have you. But that's not the point. The point I'm trying to make is that, see, he failed. He failed at... Uh, uh, achieving the goals he had set for himself by embracing freedom. Because th that's the key issue, see? If you belong, you will be safe but limited. But if you choose to be free, you might savor the satisfaction that that freedom can give you, but at the same time you will be threatened, you will have no protection, you will be on your own. Mm. And so many guys, mm, they embrace that freedom willy-nilly and, and rather thoughtlessly, 
without measuring the consequences and the costs of that freedom. They embrace it like Nietzsche did, and they dive headfirst into it like Nietzsche did, and they discover that, you know, there is the real possibility of failure. Not merely the real possibility of failure, it is a likely outcome. Failure is the likely, likely outcome to true freedom. Mm? Most guys who choose to be free, mm, they fail. Nietzsche failed. And that's why in so much of his writings and his ideas, there is this resentment and hatred towards those people who rationally decided to sacrifice their freedom for the sake of belonging. Mm? Because he refused to make that sacrifice, as I did. Yeah? And because he, f he refused to make that sacrifice, he went off on his own, figuring that he could make a living as a writer and that he would be able to make it without the protection of the German academic establishment. And he failed. He failed miserably. And he was poor and destitute and, and just living in very, very straitened circumstances until his death. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, that bred bitterness, and you can see it in his writings. That bitterness of the man who embraced freedom and yet was taken aback and shocked and surprised by the cost that that freedom entails. You see what I'm saying? In my own case, I was exceedingly fortunate because I embraced freedom and my fortunes have been up and down. Mm -hmm. No question. There have been times where I've been just high on the hog making money left and right and other times where I've been just flat broke and wondering where I was going to get my next meal. Not kidding. And as an adult, okay? I mean, things have been that extreme in my life because I decided to embrace that freedom and just run with it and do as I saw fit. But all in all, here I am at 51 and I'm pretty goddamn good, okay? I mean, my circumstances, I, I've been exceptionally fortunate. And, and that's the thing that is difficult for a lot of guys who embrace this freedom to understand or, or to accept or to internalize. You see, uh, um, freedom can give you the opportunity to achieve whatsoever you may want, might dream of, right? But there is the enormous risk of failure. It is the rational choice to sacrifice yourself in order to belong. It is the rational choice to limit yourself, to not do whatever pops into your head, to stay on the straight and narrow. It is the rational choice to do that and therefore belong and be protected by a, an industry, a society, a milieu, whatever it is that can give you that support and protection than it is to go out on your own and to be free and to potentially be struck down, or to be more likely to be struck down, struck down by bad luck, struck down by bad fortune, bad fate. Yeah, and I look at Nietzsche, who's obviously an infinitely smarter man than I ever was, yeah, and he failed. And the fact that I succeeded, that I'm doing all right, materially speaking, it's luck. It's luck. And I can prove it. How many people in the world work really goddamn hard? I bet most of them. I bet most working people, most people who are entrepreneurs, who decide to start, I don't know, a restaurant or a business or this, that, the other, whatever the fuck, whoever decides to be free and go out on their own, right? I bet you that they work goddamn hard. Do they all succeed? No, they do not, obviously. Some succeed, most fail. Why do the people fail? Because they're stupid? No. Because they're lazy? No. Because they had really, really bad luck? No, many times they had, you know, average luck. So what's going on? Why did these other people here succeed? Oh, the answer is obvious, because they were luckier. They were the recipients of the good luck. Because brains and talent and hard work in and of themselves are not enough to succeed if you decide to be free. Hmm? They're not. You need luck. A lot of luck. In my own case, I hate to brag about anything, right? Uh, but the, the thing that 
I, I'm most, most loathe to brag about is my luck because motherfucker have I been lucky. Yeah. As a writer, as a businessman, in everything that I've done, I've been so incredibly lucky. And at the time, I, I didn't have the, 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 how can I put it, the, the, the graciousness, the humility to realize how fucking lucky I really was. No, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to do this and you know, I'll, I'll make it somehow, right? It's only later, after the fact, that I look back and I was like, holy fucking shit, was I lucky. A thousand guys tried to do what I just did and I made it. And I know in my heart that it wasn't because I was the smartest or the hardest working. Uh -uh. It was because I was the fucking luckiest. And, and lucky though I have been, my luck doesn't always hold out. <laughs> uh -uh. A lot of times my luck has decided to just go out the window for a while, you know, take a break. Go out and see the town, maybe light on somebody else's good fortune and leave me high and dry. Yeah, that's happened to me a few times for a few stretches of my life. Yeah. And I worked my fucking ass off and came to nothing. Yeah. There were some years, there were some years that I worked my ass off, just, just killing myself. And I was using all kinds of brain power and all kinds of effort and 18 hour days and just doing everything right, everything to make it happen. And it didn't happen. It did not happen. So I know for a fact that if you decide to be free, you're going to have to really depend on luck. You know? Yeah. And so sometimes it might be better, smarter. It's frankly, it's the rational choice to trim your sails and be not so free and fit in and belong because it really does feel so wonderful to belong, even if incompletely. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, as an adult, you're never going to fit in. You're never going to feel that sense of belonging completely. Like I explained at the beginning of this video when I was a child, that I, I felt that I belonged completely, that every single cell in my body just fit in that particular place in the universe. Yeah, that sense, it, it'll never come again. It'll never come again. And I yearn for it. You have no idea the yearning for that moment, for that sense of belonging and the regret that at the time I didn't realize how valuable it was and how I would never experience it again. Mm -hmm. I remember the, the last time I felt truly and completely in my place. I was 11 years old. I was in the fifth grade and we went out camping somewhere. We were living in Westchester County mm -hmm. and we went out but my school, we went camping somewhere for like a long weekend, right? And I felt so happy. And I remember very clearly we went hiking one time. And it wasn't a particularly difficult hike. I mean, we're all 11-year-old kids, right? But we hiked around. It must have been maybe, I don't know, a few miles, two, three miles at most. Yeah, it was an hour or so. But, you know, this hike that we did around some little hills around the area, and we were all together and I felt wonderful. It was so happy, right? And that's the last time I felt truly and completely that I belonged. Mm -hmm. That all the people with me in my group, we were all friends and that we were all happy to be with one another. That was the last time I felt that. That was 40 years ago. Mm -hmm. It was the last time I felt that, that sense of complete and utter belonging. And since then, at best, it's been partial. At best, it's been the sense that I like, yeah, I'm having a good time with these people. I like all these people. These people are all great, but there's always that separation, that sense of alienation. And I'm here to tell you that, you know, whichever route you choose, if you choose the rational route of limiting yourself in order to fit in, or you choose the irrational route of eschewing any kind of limitation and deciding that you're going to be free, free to pursue your life on your terms with the likelihood of failure, the likelihood, not the chance, the likelihood of failure. Well, regardless of which road you take, you will never have that sense of belonging again. Okay. And if you choose to be a part of the cog, you will always have that sense of partial belonging. Mm -hmm. And facets of you that will always be alienated. Alienation is, it's a product of modernism, okay? 
and that's for a longer discussion. But ultimately, what has happened is that two, three hundred years ago, we decided that we would sacrifice our small communities where we all were born, lived, and died within a five mile radius, right? And with all the same people in our lives, we, would, we decided that we would sacrifice these communities and create these incredible cities that would draw people in from the country and slot them in into the factories, slot them into the jobs that would create the enormous wealth that we enjoy today. The civilization that we have, this incredible civilization, yeah? the, the, all the infrastructure, the inventions, the, the planes that can travel and take us around the globe instantly, the communication technology that allows us to speak on a screen with another human being literally on the other side of the globe without cost. <laughs> All of these incredible inventions, this incredible infrastructure, uh, these incredible technology, this incredible civilization that we enjoy, the price, the price of it all was us losing those little communities where we all came from, of losing that, that sense of the village where everybody knows your name and everybody knows who you are and everybody loves you. We sacrifice that in order to create the civilization. Mm, yeah. Mm. Was it worth it? I don't know. Sometimes I think yes. Many times, most days I think yes. But sometimes, you know, when you feel so alone, when you feel so alienated and disconnected from everyone, and you feel as if you're just completely out of place, that's not merely that you're a, a square peg in a universe of round holes, but you, you feel that you're, you're just, you know, just made of some other material. I mean, it's just, you know, when you feel that alienated, yeah, then you start to question whether it's worth it or not. I guess what I'm trying to say is that we all feel this way. We all feel this disconnection. We all feel this alienation. And it's up to each of us to figure out which path to take to negotiate how much of ourselves we, would, we will sacrifice in order to belong and which parts of ourselves are sacrosanct. 